part of Kentucky, a man is building an ark. He doesn't think he's the new Noah, but he does think the Bible story may in fact be factual and he wants to open a theme park to make the case. In the snowy peaks of eastern Turkey, an exploration team embarked on a quest to uncover Noah's Ark from the Great Flood. Research teams have persistently searched Mount Ararat for years, determined to find evidence of the historical existence of the legendary Noah's Ark from the Bible. The crew was led by Dr. Fatih Ahmed Yuksel. They found a remarkable man-made structure dating back 4,800 years. But will this evidence be accepted by the scientists? Join us in today's video when we discover all the mystery around Noah Ark's finding. Where is Noah's Ark? According to the Bible, the Ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat after the floodwaters receded. Mount Ararat is located in present-day Turkey, near the border with Armenia and Iran. However, despite many expeditions and claims, no definitive archaeological evidence of the Ark's existence has been found on Mount Ararat or elsewhere. The story of Noah's Ark is primarily a religious narrative, and its exact location remains a mystery. The age-old mystery of the existence of Noah's Ark may have been finally solved by a team of explorers who claim to have found its remains beneath the snow and volcanic debris of Turkey's Mount Ararat. However, while some are excited by the discovery, others are skeptical. Additionally, historians and archaeologists who have dealt with the subject in the past are also skeptical. Come aboard the voyage of Noah's Ark the legendary ship that saved humanity and the world's creatures from a catastrophic flood. This iconic tale has been told throughout history, with various civilizations sharing their own versions of the story. But the explorers who made the discovery is confident that they have finally found what they have been looking for. While numerous expeditions have produced no conclusive evidence, the Noah's Ark Scans project has discovered a colossal shape in Turkey's mountains that precisely matches the description of the biblical account of the flood. Nevertheless, some experts believe that the biblical account of the flood is incompatible with modern science, particularly the geological record of the planet's age. Despite this skepticism, many have been searching for the physical remains of the Ark, with the search dating back to the 3rd century. Dr. Fatih Ahmed Yuksel, the lead scientist and researcher Andrew Jones presented their findings to the British media, saying that the unusual parallel lines and right angles they found beneath the surface could not be explained by natural geological processes. These outcomes are what you would expect to see if this is a man-made boat that satisfies the biblical requirements of Noah's Ark, Jones said. Despite the excitement surrounding this discovery, some geologists are still skeptical. A group of daring explorers claim to have discovered the remains of Noah's Ark itself atop Mount Ararat in Turkey. They discovered seven enormous wooden compartments buried at a dizzying height of 13,000 feet above sea level last year. This year, they returned to the site with a film crew to capture the historic moment. The claim of finding Noah's Ark has long been debated and controversial. While some people think the remains of the legendary ship exist on Mount Ararat, others are skeptical of the recent discovery. The team has kept the exact location of the discovery a secret, but they claim that the radiocarbon dating of the wood confirms that the Ark is around 4,800 years old, corresponding to the time of Noah's flood as described in the Bible. There were no widely accepted discoveries of Noah's Ark or conclusive scientific evidence to confirm its existence. While there have been claims and expeditions related to the search for Noah's Ark, none have provided definitive evidence that has been widely accepted by the scientific community. Despite the controversy, Dr. Yuxel and researcher Jones were thrilled they could potentially unravel at least a portion of the centuries-old mystery surrounding the existence of Noah's Ark. Further study of the surprising organic artifacts extracted from the frigid depths of Mount Ararat may indeed reinforce the hypothesis that these remains originate from the fabled biblical lifeboat itself. You see, 
There is a lot of controversy surrounding whether or not Noah's Ark has actually been found. Some scientists claim they have indeed found evidence of the Ark's existence. Others firmly insist that the Ark never really existed. There is an opinion that modern man has overcomplicated God. Man's brilliant mind has forgotten God. Therefore, God has given man over to a reprobate mind. It's all in front of our face and we're blinded or many are, but many still see God's simplicity. Samples from Noah's Ark site in Turkey reveal human activity. The findings, released earlier this week, of rock and soil samples determined that clay materials, marine materials, and seafood were present in the area between 5500 and 3000 BC. Located less than two miles from the Iran-Turkey border, a 538-foot geographic feature made of limonite believed by some to be the petrified remains of Noah's Ark. Scientists collected nearly 30 rock and soil samples from the area of the ruins and analyzed the findings at the Istanbul Technical University. The dating study revealed the samples to be between 3,500 and 5,000 years old, or from 3,000 BC, the most recent time when the catastrophic flood is believed to have occurred. According to the first findings obtained from the studies, it is thought that there have been human activities in the region since the Chalcolithic period, that is, between the years 5500 and 3000 BC. The Darupinar site is 18 miles south of the greater Mount Ararat summit, which the Book of Genesis states is where the Ark came to rest on the seventh month and seventeenth day. The formation was first discovered by a Kurdish farmer in 1948 before Turkish Army Captain Ilhan Durupinar identified the site in 1951 when he was flying over the area while on a NATO mapping mission, according to the Noah's Ark Scans project. Scientists debate Noah's Ark existence amid new findings. For a long time, scientists around the world have pondered the existence of Noah's Ark, as described in the biblical story and the reality of the flood said to have destroyed the entire Earth. Noah's Ark and the Flood have captivated researchers for years, with many eagerly sharing their discoveries and theories. An intriguing finding occurred when scientists identified an unusual rock formation on Mount Tenderek, near the Turkish-Iranian border, resembling the dimensions of the biblical Ark. This peculiar rock formation on Mount Tenderek caught attention in 1959, thanks to aerial photographs captured by the military. Subsequent research, including advanced 3D scanning, suggests that structures beneath the surface might be man-made, possibly even the remnants of a ship. Measurements taken by American and Turkish scientists from the Noah's Ark Scan project indicate that the formation's dimensions closely match those of Noah's Ark, as described in the Bible. 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. The data gathered suggests a higher likelihood of encountering a man-made structure resembling Noah's Ark, with ground-penetrating radar and electrical resistivity tomography revealing artificial constructs composed of parallel lines and angular shapes, uncharacteristic of natural rock formations. However, the consensus is not unanimous. Many geologists argue that the rock formation lacks wood particles, a critical component of the Ark's biblical description. They also note that natural processes can mimic structures that appear to be designed by humans. Some scientists, such as Professor David Montgomery from the University of Washington, outright dismiss the possibility of a global flood. They underline the insufficiency of water on Earth to cover its entire surface, including the highest mountains. Citing research by the U.S. Geological Survey, Live Science notes that even if all atmospheric water precipitated at once, it would only result in a depth of about one inch of water globally. The feasibility of an ark housing every animal species becomes questionable under this scrutiny. Even with all glaciers and ice caps melted, a scenario NASA has explored, and considering the volume of groundwater, dry land would still exist. These findings suggest that waters would envelop the Earth to a depth of about 590 feet at most. Moreover, 
geologists find no evidence of a global flood in the geological record, casting further doubts on the literal interpretation of Noah's Ark and the flood. Consequently, these elements of biblical narrative are more likely allegorical rather than literal accounts of past events. Noah's Ark Controversy Gavin Ortland explaining his belief the Genesis 6 narrative is about a regional event that was in a huge area of the earth, but not all over the globe. Ortlund said, I just wanted to help people understand some of the arguments for that view, help people understand that there actually are differences within Orthodox Christianity. Historically, a lot of people are not aware of that. As for Ortlund's own beliefs, he said he tends to lean toward thinking the flood was local or regional. Noting, though, he doesn't necessarily believe it was small in scope, even if limited to a particular geographic area. In the end, he said, the debate boils down to how one interprets the story of Noah in Genesis. One of the factors, according to Ortland, was the confined nature of humanity at that time. There really is a good case, actually, that, in its original meaning, the author and the original hearers wouldn't be thinking of all of the globe of planet Earth, so this is just a matter of interpreting scripture, he said. Humanity at this point appears to also have just been regional. This is before the dispersion of human beings that happens after the Tower of Babel and Genesis 10 and 11, so all of human beings are in this one portion of the earth at this point before they had dispersed throughout the world. Ortland cited the fact that Bible writers likely didn't know about American continents, among other bits of information surrounding the extent of planet Earth during the Genesis narrative. Ortland said, All of us are responding to the progress of science and knowledge about planet Earth and having to adjust our interpretation of Scripture accordingly. Not because Scripture is not true, but because we're trying to interpret what does the text mean in its original context, viewing the world from an ancient perspective and using language that reflected that perspective building the ark. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Floating on the endless waters of destruction for months, Noah might have felt cursed and forgotten, not favored. Christians can relate to the challenges Noah faced, waiting on God and remembering his promises. To make this point clear, let's start at the beginning of the biblical narrative and follow the story step by step. From the moment the impending storm is announced and Jehovah sets forth the design and dimensions of the ark, problems start appearing. The ark is to be made out of gopher wood according to a plan that calls for the ark to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits tall. It is to contain three floors, a large door in the side, and a one cubit square window at the top. The floors are to be divided into rooms, and all the walls, inside and out, are to be pitched with pitch. Since the purpose of the ark is to hold animals and plants, particularly two of every living thing of all flesh, to keep them alive with thee, it will have to be constructed accordingly. On the other hand, in an era when hollowed-out logs and reed rafts were the extent of marine transport, a vessel so massive appeared that the likes of it would not be seen again until the mid-19th century A.D. Before he could even contemplate such a project, Noah would have needed a thorough education in naval architecture and in fields that would not arise for thousands of years, such as physics, calculus, mechanics, and structural analysis. There was no shipbuilding tradition behind him, no experienced craftspeople to offer advice. How could he anticipate the effects of roll, pitch, yaw, and slamming in a rough sea? How did he solve the differential equations for bending moment, torque, and shear stress? Ancient shipbuilding did achieve a considerable level of technological sophistication, so much so that marine archaeologists are divided over its history but this was for vessels that were dinghies compared to the Ark, and this skill emerged slowly over many centuries. Nearly a millennium passed, 
while Egyptian boat lengths increase from 150 to 200 feet. Despite this, the craft remained a prescientific art, acquired through long years of apprenticeship and experience, and disasters at sea due to faulty design were so persistent that the impetus was strong for a more scientific approach. Obviously, the astronomical leap in size, safety, and skill required by NOAA is far too vast for any naturalistic explanation. NOAA's primary contribution to humanity, his incredible knowledge of naval engineering, vanished without a trace, and the seafarers returned to their hollow logs and reed rafts. Like a passing mirage, the Ark was here one day and gone the next, leaving not a ripple in the long saga of shipbuilding. With space at a premium, every cubit had to be utilized to the maximum. There was no room for oversized cages and wasted space. The various requirements of the myriads of animals had to be taken into account in the design of their quarters, especially considering the length of the voyage. The problems are legion. Feeding and watering troughs need to be the correct height for easy access, but not on the floor where they will get filthy. The cages for horned animals must have bars spaced properly to prevent their horns from getting stuck, while rhinos require round bomas for the same reason. A heavy leather body sling is indispensable for transporting giraffes. Primates require tamper-proof locks on their doors. Perches must be the correct diameter for each particular bird's foot. Even the flooring is important, for if it is too hard, hooves may be injured. If too soft, they may grow too quickly and permanently damage ankles. Rats will suffer decubitis with improper floors, and ungulates must have a cleated surface, or they will slip and fall. These and countless other technical problems all had to be resolved before the first termite crawled aboard, but there were no wildlife management experts available for consultation. Even today, the transport requirements of many species are not fully known, and it would be physically impossible to design a single carrier to meet them all. Apparently, when God first told Noah to build an ark, he supplied a complete set of blueprints and engineering details, constituting the most intricate and precise revelation ever vouchsafed to humankind. So Noah grabbed his tools and went to work. Noah and his three sons could have built the entire thing by themselves in a mere 81 years. This includes not merely framing up a hull, but building docks, scaffolds, workshops, fitting together the incredible maze of cages and crates, gathering provisions for the coming voyage, harvesting the timber and producing all the various types of lumber from birdcage bars to the huge keelson beams, not to mention wrestling the very heavy, clumsy planks for the ship into their exact location and fastening them. What's worse, by the time the job was finished, the earlier phases would be rotting away, a difficulty often faced by builders of wooden ships, whose work took only four or five years. Genesis 6, 19-20 declares that two of each kind of animal were to be collected and brought on board. This is repeated in Genesis 7, 8-9, and it is explicitly stated that this applied to clean and unclean beasts as well as to birds. But Genesis 7, 3 specifies that clean beasts and birds were to be taken by sevens. Whatever the numbers, it is clear that no animals could be left out. Genesis 7-4 states that every living substance that God made was to be destroyed from off the face of the earth by the impending flood. Genesis 7-23 repeats the point and adds that only those things with Noah in the ark could survive. Significance of Noah's Ark some compared the flood to the second coming, because for the unbelievers who scoff at Christians, it will be business as usual until the very day Jesus returns. On that day, as it was when Noah sealed the doors of the ark against latecomers, it will be too late. Just as God didn't prepare two arks, he doesn't have two plans of salvation. Noah foreshadows the Messiah in this sense. He had to remain faithful for a long time. Scripture is not specific about how long it took him and his sons to build the ark, but it was a massive undertaking. 
since they were the only men God would save, were they the only men involved in building the Ark? If so, then the project would have taken even longer than with a team of boat builders on board. We don't know if Noah had ever sailed. If he knew how to build even a small structure, this might have been the first time he picked up the tools for such a job. Christians know what it's like to wait for God to give a yes to prayer, and they understand what it's like to wait for the real Savior to return. Noah and his sons needed patience to complete their work. They had to toil under the constant scrutiny and perhaps laughter of those who would pass them in their labors and shake their heads, express disbelief, or openly ridicule them. Jesus and his disciples were also mocked, rejected, and threatened with physical violence up until the end of Christ's mortal life when those threats were realized. They could relate to Noah, the outsider, and laughingstock. Regarding the whereabouts of Noah's Ark today, it remains a topic of curiosity and debate. While some individuals and organizations have claimed to have discovered remnants or locations purported to be the site of Noah's Ark, these claims have not been universally accepted or verified by the broader Christian community. It is important to remember that the significance of Noah's Ark lies not only in its physical existence, but also in its symbolic importance as a testament to God's faithfulness, provision, and salvation. Rather than focusing solely on the physical whereabouts of the Ark, we are encouraged to reflect on the spiritual lessons and messages conveyed in Genesis. The story of Noah's Ark prompts us to consider themes of obedience, trust, redemption, and the promise of new beginnings. Two thousand years after the Great Flood, Daniel prayed to God, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary. Jesus told his followers, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Not a single theme or word appears in Scripture by accident. Readers can find hope in God's merciful reminder, I will supply the light you need. The modern reader can imagine a ferry or a cruise ship where there is plenty of light. Compartments that are airy and passengers can climb to the top deck, watching waves roll, birds soar, and whales follow. The Ark was not like a modern ferry. It was not built for pleasure, but protection. God's blueprint included an opening at the top, which would draw fresh air into the Ark and suck out the fetid smell of sweat and dung. The opening also let in light, which would have been practical for performing daily duties. Even more than that, light reached Noah during the long days when he might have felt hopeless and forgotten. God knew what psychiatrists and doctors understand today. We need light to survive. God speaks, He provides direction, and then, once a plan is set in motion, there is a long wait before the purpose of that plan becomes clear. The light goes out, the visual equivalent of God's silence, leading to hopelessness. And then we remember the light. During the darkness you may have felt quite dead, but suddenly the life of God is there again, and you begin to move forward. This narrow space at the top of Noah's floating world was a reminder to Noah that he not only needed light, but God had already worked light into his plans for Noah's future. Not just light for Noah, but light for the world. Noah's Ark gives Christians a foretaste of what that really means. Noah was not sinless, but he was faithful, and God saved him. As with Abraham, his faith was counted to him as righteousness. So, it is with Christians now, waiting for Christ to return, just as Noah waited for light to glint off of a dripping mountain peak, poking out of the water. God directed and Noah obeyed, built the ark, loaded up, closed the doors, and water rose around him all land disappeared. He waited for about a year from the first rainfall until a dove brought him an olive branch, the sign that land had re-emerged. During this time, God might have spoken again, but no mention is made of it. Noah must have begun to wonder whether God had forgotten him 
his family and the animals as they floated like insignificant bits of refuse on the great tide. Most believers know that feeling. At first, God seems to provide direction through scripture, prayer, even advertisements on billboards and songs on the radio. They are signs that a door is opening or closing. What a relief to receive such clear direction. While one might feel abandoned or worthless during the long wait for step two, God does not forget his children. God had never actually forgotten Noah, for God never forgets anything. Scripture portrays God as forgetting and remembering in order to make him accessible and familiar. If you think yourself to be abandoned by God, the hope is in knowing that God will act again. And in the meantime, your job is to go on in faithful obedience to what he has already shown you, however long ago that may have been, for it is God's nature to remember. He is faithful. Later, when Noah's ordeal was over, he and his animal and human had disembarked, Noah remembered God. He showed it by building an altar and then sacrificing some of all the clean animals and clean birds as sin offerings. Although we forget God's goodness immediately after we have been delivered from some distressing situation, Noah did not forget. What example has Noah set for the Christian living thousands of years after the Great Flood? We pick up our crosses and follow Christ, making a sacrifice of joy and gratitude, our desires for His desires. Our sacrifice is not duty or legalism. The Lord wants mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God, rather than burnt offerings. We want signs like the dove carrying an olive branch, but Christ's death and resurrection was our sign of His love and faithfulness. Meanwhile, the Lord desires a sign from us, His children, patience, which demonstrates our trust in Him, thankfulness, which honors and glorifies the Lord. Noah knew God's loving, omnipotent character before he closed the ark door and shut out all latecomers who had ignored the evidence of God's glory. He knew he could trust God. We also have evidence of God's goodness, His kindness, His power, His faithfulness, God's character reflected in Jesus Christ. All we need to do now is to remember. After 150 days, the Lord brought a great wind over the earth, causing the waters to subside and the ark came to rest on top of Mat Ararat. Noah released a dove. When the dove did not return, Noah opened the covering of the ark and saw that the waters had dried up from the ground. God instructed him to bring his family and all the creatures out of the ark. What was the first thing Noah did upon exiting the ark? He built an altar to God and presented him with an offering, giving thanks to him for his provision and God made a promise never to flood the earth again, setting a rainbow in the sky as a sign of this covenant with mankind. The story of Noah and the flood is one of judgment and salvation, of obedience and disobedience. In an era of overwhelming wickedness, Noah set himself apart by living righteously. Noah was likely mocked for building a giant boat when no flood was yet seen upon the earth, but he did not worry about what other people thought. He simply responded to God's commands with a willing heart and hands. God rewarded him for his righteousness and obedience, saving both him and his family from destruction. The story of the flood also demonstrates both the gravity of God's justice and the promise of his salvation. Every sin we commit grieves God and his justice demands judgment for that sin. Just as God provided salvation for Noah and his family, when his judgment was brought upon the world, so also does God provide salvation for each of his followers through Christ.